The social web as we know it today is a matriarchy. The number one users of Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, Yelp, I could go on, are you guessed it, mothers. In this country alone, there are four million mom bloggers, and that number is rapidly growing. A handful of those women collectively have a readership greater than the New York Times. Yeah, <laughs> it's powerful. Not only that, mothers control 85% of the household spending in the country to the tune of trillions of dollars. That's with a T. And four out of 10 households, it was just found, are, are the primary or the sole breadwinner is a mom, and that's households with children. TechCrunch said that women and mothers are the rocket fuel of e-commerce. They're the routers and the amplifiers of the social web. So it wasn't always this way. Back in 2004, 10 years ago this month, we started blogging. And that was a time where the word mom blogger didn't exist, but we discovered this community of moms online. We fell in love with their voices and the sense of community that was there. And then in 2005, there was a moment in time where we all woke up to the power of the web, and that was in August of 2005 when Katrina hit, and we were all yelling at our TVs because there were people stuck on their rooftops with flooded waters all around them, and nobody was doing anything. And we wanted to do something. We wanted anything. We wanted to do something. So we went to the NOLA website, and we saw that people were offering temporary housing. And we thought back to 9-11, when people all across the country sent things to New York, and they were stockpiled because they, and rotted because there was no distribution system to get the donations to people who needed them. So we said, wait a second. If people have temporary housing, people could send something to them directly. So at that point, we've been blogging for a couple of years, and we said, you know what? We're going to put up a blog post because we all have so much stuff. We all have things in our closet that we never wear, that, we've, that our kids have outgrown, or things in our attic that are just off there we don't really know what to do with. And we asked our readers if they would put in the comments what they might have to donate to people of the Gulf Coast who had lost everything. So within 24 hours, donations, thousands of donations streamed in. It was, we actually had to rebuild our website to handle the traffic. And it was unbelievable, the creativity and the imagination that people brought to this, because we all wanted to do something. I mean, remember now, it was, you know, this was before Twitter. This was before Facebook. We were all wanting to get into action in some way. And so people offered homemade quilts. One person donated a used Audi. There was um, used beauty parlor chairs that were in mint conditions. There was baby clothes. There was so much that was being offered to help people who had lost so much. And it was all started by moms with blogs and their loyal, devoted community of followers back before Facebook and Twitter had even was a glimmer in the eye. And so what happened and what we watched all in the, in the comment section of this blog, one blog post, is people were donating. And we had figured out a way to become a community cork board. So people were donating. And then the people who had that specific need connected. Now, this was slow and laborious. It was one woman and one woman. And that's what emerged. It was all women connecting. So a woman who had something to give or donate, and someone who, a woman who desperately needed something, anything, because she had lost everything in this catastrophic storm. So the women who were donating were filling boxes. And not only were they putting in their in-kind donations, they were including drawings that their children had done. <laughs> prayers, letters of support, anything that would just make it personal and, more, and make things, make it stand out and feel good, because that's what we do, right? And then we would hear from the receivers, and they, you know, think about this. It was over 100 degrees. It was, we, we can't even imagine the devastation. And you had to walk miles, miles, just to get to a place where you could stand in line for hours to get a small amount of supplies. One woman pushed her stroller, she stood in line for seven hours, got a couple things that she could fit on the stroller, and walked back. But then, where she was staying, she got a box. And in that box was something for her. And there was a drawing, and there was a prayer. And her, we heard from her sister, because there was, the communication was 
obviously, um, that it made absolutely all the difference getting that box. This was within four days of the levees breaking. The Saturday after the levees broke, the powers of the bees stood up and he gave his speech. And he said, relief efforts have failed. The day before, in part using our blog, a group of women filled an 18-wheeler with supplies and got it from Chicago to Louisiana. That's the day before. This was a moment. This was an absolute epiphany for both of us. I mean, we were just, it, we, we were absolutely knocked down by the fact that here we're looking at these institutions that are supposed to do their job, and they didn't. They didn't do their job. But we, as individuals, we had the tools. We could use a blog post and comments to make the difference that we needed to make because we wanted to make it. So here's what we saw. Mothers went online and they made it happen. They shared their stories. They listened and supported each other, and they worked together to make things a little better. And those four things are what we've seen ever since have been the driving actions to make the social web a better place. So in March 2006 was when we created a web community, and that was also the same year that Daniel Pink wrote a book called, it's an unbelievable book, if you haven't read it, you should, it's a TED Talk, it's called The Whole New Mind, it's why, why right brain thinkers will rule the world. And in it, he predicted that empathizers, storytellers, caregivers, big picture thinkers, meaning makers will rule the world. And they will also reap the great joy of that going forward. So to give you an example of that, so one person that we imagine Daniel Pink might have been thinking of, a meaning maker, is a woman, Colin's mom. So not very long ago, just uh, days ago, weeks ago, Colin's mom posted to Facebook. And this is what she posted. I'm going to read you just part of her post. She said, I am Colin's mom. I created this page for my amazing, wonderful, challenging son who's about to turn 11 on March 9th. Because of Colin's disabilities, social skills are not easy for him, and he often acts out in school, and the other kids don't like him. So when I asked him if he wanted a party for his birthday, he said there wasn't a point because he has no friends. So I thought, if I could create a page where people could send him positive thoughts and encouraging words, that would be better than any birthday party. Please join me in making my very original son feel special that on his day. Okay, so in a couple of weeks, almost two million likes on his page. People are sending cards and they're sending gifts directly to him. There's a, there's a man who had his same birthday and he posted a picture of himself blowing out a birthday cake. There's classrooms making cards and sending them to Colin because it's a lesson in kindness. It's made international news. Now, we've all heard stories like this on Facebook where people have got into action, but here's what's going on we all know. Colin's mom, when she wrote it, that, like, she, her heart was breaking, but it touched us. It connected with us. And it's around that connection that we are all getting in action, but let's also know that those actions are also, it's not only what's happening on the web, it's also what's shaped the web. So the founders of Facebook said in the early days that there were three actions that women did on Facebook more than men. To a great degree, they posted to their walls, they shared photos, and they joined groups. And that was what partly drove the development of Facebook. So we have to understand that those actions of connections are also shaping the web as we know it. And it really is about strengthening relationships and making connections. And the connections are the spark. So when women connect, they engage. And when they engage, they embrace. And when they embrace, they drive. Comscore actually said that that series is the future. And it really is the future. And this is how it plays out. There's a woman named Renee who had noticed that the food dyes in the, in the, in the candy that her son was eating affected him. And it, um, it bothered her. She wanted him to, to talk about it and make change about it to the point where she actually testified to the FDA about it. Nothing. Nada. She takes it to the social web. She gets a, uh, a petition going with 
now, as of yesterday, had 150,000 signatures on it. And word is that this particular product is going to be eliminating, at least in part, some of those dyes. But it took the petition and talking on the web among themselves to drive that. Getting in front of the FDA didn't do anything. And it's interesting, the women, women on the web and how they use it to make these mobilization, that to mobilize and to change. I mean, it's, it's not only being online. It, we did a study recently where 92% of women who learn about something that moves them or that they care about, when they learn about it online, 92% take it offline. And they talk about it and they mobilize, not only in their families, but in their communities and with their friends and in the carpool line or wherever they are, 92%. <laughs> And then the amplification happens elsewhere too. There was a group of bloggers who noticed that a particular fast food chain had a chicken sandwich with over, well, almost 100 ingredients in it, including a byproduct of butane. And so they started to talk about it. Traditional media picked it up. So at this point, the butane byproduct, antibiotics, and a whole host of other ingredients are now eliminated from that particular product. Because of that amplification, it just started with conversations on the web, on blogs in particular. And it's not just the big things. It's not just these big things where you mobilize and make change. It's the little things, too. Women, and this is a, this is a true survey, women will give up their engagement ring before they give up their smartphone. <laughs> because they can't live without those tools. The number one user of the tools that make your life simpler our moms. You can't live without them. They are the lifeline, the lifeblood of how we keep our days going. So it's not just mobilizing to make huge change on these massive products. It is to find a recipe. What the heck am I going to cook for dinner tonight? Women will go to a blog post before they'll go to a cookbook that's on their shelf. They will turn to a friend. They turn to Twitter. Cooking Light will tweet every day around 4 o'clock, hey, who has chicken breasts? Here's a recipe. I mean, and you should see how many followers they have because they're solving that problem and they're creating that conversation. So one of the things that's happening along the lines of this is we're circling the wagons as well. We're using the web to circle the wagon. And we've, since the beginning of time, have been involved in causes. We've led them and supported them and seen how collective action can make such an impact. And then we've also seen it in smaller ways. So uh, a blogger friend of ours, Rachel Fawcett, who had her online name is uh, Handmade Charlotte, she posted to Pinterest the other day, she has 600,000 Pinterest followers, and she posted a, uh, ideas for making DIY musical instruments. Within days, she had 1,000 repins, and what that means is that within days, thousands of women said, thank you, I appreciate the fact that you've come up with a budget-friendly way for me to bring musical instruments into my home, and I'm going to not only post it to my Pinterest board so I can refer back to it at any time, but I'm going to share it with my many, many followers. And that's a circling of wagons. There's, there's another, I mean, circling of wagons can also take a surprising turn as well. There's um, CJ's mom, Haley, there's a, she's posted recently about her son, CJ, who is, was a veteran, and he was um, 20 years old when he committed suicide. And Haley didn't know what to do with his ashes. His ashes sat on an urn, in an urn, on, his, on her mantle for three years. And then she got an idea. She thought, you know what? I want CJ to see the world. I want him to have an adventure. And so she posted to her social media channels asking if people would sprinkle his ashes for her. And she got inundated with responses from people who, friends and strangers, who said, I'll sprinkle them in my hometown. I'll take them on vacation with me, or I'll just post them. I'll sprinkle them somewhere beautiful. And so she sent out 150 packets, and including uh, recently posted to Facebook as a member of the US snowboard team sprinkled his ashes in Sochi. And here's what's happening there, where we see that she wanted an adventure for him, but then we also, she, she created this life-affirming adventure for him, for her memory of him, but then we got to be a part of it. That was life-affirming for us to get to participate with her in that. And haven't mothers always done this? I mean, since the beginning of time, we've done this. We've organized to make things better, to circle the wagons, 
It's something that, well, there, there's a group of, of, of moms in 1889 in Western Pennsylvania who noticed that the soot correlated with illness in their children. And so they organized to create a, a resource. It became becoming the first kind of environmental reform group in this country. <coughs> And so it's something that mothers have always, always done. And in it is creating neighborhood. Because mothers know that in creating community and creating neighborhood, it makes their own life better. It makes their children's life better. But it also makes their communities better. And in this act of creating neighborhood, it's not something that appears out of thin air. It's something that takes those big gestures and those little gestures and the kindness and the day-to-day -day things that we do to create what a neighborhood is. And when you're creating neighborhood, maybe what we're doing is also creating a verb, a verb in the word neighboring. And in their souls and in their hearts, mothers were born to do just that. So there's a woman we know who runs an NGO. She's lived all over the world in developing countries. And she told us a few years back, she said in every country she's ever lived in, in every village, in every neighborhood, in the US included, there was always someone, there were always people who were the go-to people. They were the mobilizers. They were the village reporters. They were the ones who got things done. And she said, you, invariably, those women were often the mothers. They were the mothers doing that. But now as we look at the 21st century neighborhood, and the web is a tool for all of us, we all can be that person. We actually all are that person. We are the connector and the mobilizer and the change maker. So we wanna leave you with an idea today. And that idea is that we can use our social media channels to fix the problems in our neighborhoods, online or off. So when you leave today, as you go online today or going forward, Think about the problems that, you're, that are going on and how you can use your channels to make something happen small or big. And then also tell your neighbors. Tell your neighbors that you appreciate them, that you appreciate the power that they have and that the power that you have together because we can make this happen. We can make, we can fix these problems in the world together by using our social media. Tools.